Uh, I know that some in our audience know the finer points of hockey. The Chris Johnston Show. We are your friends. The biggest stories bringing you inside the game. What did you hear? The Chris Johnston Show. What is going on? Here's Chris with your host, Julian McKenzie. Part of the game. CJ is in Tempe. Days ahead of what could be the final game for the Arizona Coyotes at home before they move to Salt Lake City. Uh, if you read The Athletic, uh, he has a column up today, how the Coyotes' Salt Lake relocation plan came together and what issues remain. We're doing this on April 15th. The game, their last game is on the Wednesday. How soon could this relocation plan be announced? Well, from what I've been able to gather over the weekend, Julian, I think that there's a pretty good sense that between all the parties involved here that it would be best to get it done before the start of the playoffs, which, check your calendars, is Saturday. Now, that's not a guarantee that we'll be able to get it done. It is a pretty complex transaction. Essentially, what's happening is Alex Murillo is going to keep the, the rights to the Coyotes brand, the logo, the marks under what's being discussed here. This is assuming the plan goes through. I mean, I, I should put the caveat right off the top. Lots of deals fall apart at the last minute. I'm not predicting that here, but I'm just saying we're reporting on the deals that are being discussed at their at the 11th hour. I mean, clearly they're well down the track on this plan, but, but something could happen here. And so I don't want to, if my language veers too much into like this is happening for sure, I'm just, I'm trying to check myself. But, you know, what's being discussed is he keeps those marks. He gets a five-year window whereby if he builds an NHL quality facility, he has the rights to the expansion franchise in Arizona in that time. He can't sell those rights. He can't transfer them. They belong only to him if he brings the team back. Uh, he'd be paid a billion dollars by the league to relinquish the Coyotes' hockey assets, we'll call it for better terms. That would be the price he would have to pay a billion dollars for the expansion team down the road if he gets that, that arena built. And so, you know, that's one side of the transaction. Then, of course, the, the, the NHL is brokering in the middle you know, selling the players, the contracts, the draft picks, the hockey operations staff, trainers, coaches, what have you, to Salt Lake um, and, and to Ryan Smith at, at a premium to that, $1.2 billion, give or take, with the rest of the money going to NHL owners. So it's it's a complex set of things that have to happen. And, and from what I heard over the weekend, one of the big outstanding issues is the exact language around how does Alex Morello get that expansion team back? What is the timeline? Does it is it does he have to have a shovel in the ground after four years ready to play in the fifth year? Is it, you know, like exactly how that will work, I think, is is one of, you know, it's it's a not insignificant issue, right? Because for Morello, a big part of this deal is, I mean, first of all, he's, he's getting paid or he's due to be paid a billion dollars. You know, at the time he bought the Coyotes in 2019, it was reported the cost was $300 million. So he's made a nice return on investment, if nothing else. But for him, he still believes, like the NHL, that that hockey will work in Arizona. Uh, but it, it's got to work in an arena in a proper facility. And so, you know, he wants to continue pushing forward to to getting a rink. And so the exact timeline, how that would work, I think it's still to be ironed out. So this is a very strange week as I sit here in the desert because, you know, I, I don't know when the deal is going to get done. I can't tell you if it's going to be Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. But let's assume it's not announced or completed you know, by that game on Wednesday night. I just think it's going to be a strange environment. You know, I know you're around the players in Calgary there as they played on Sunday. Like, it's kind of a no-win weird spot for them because they don't, you know, all the while that they're sort of planning, I'm sure anyone with a contract anyway for next season, that they're they're likely moving to Salt Lake City. You know, there's also this possibility that, you know, if it doesn't get done, that they're, they're right where they are. So it, everyone's kind of in the middle. The reporters, obviously the people trying to make the deal, and then obviously the players and staff who are most affected by this, obviously, in terms of potentially having to uproot their lives. And, you know, know that they're having calls with the NHL Players Association, you know, discussing what they might be paid as part of this move. I mean, there's a there's a kind of a lot of tentacles to it, and, and I just don't know when that resolution is going to come exactly. I know that GM Bill Armstrong has already kind of, given some idea to his players about what's going on uh, of course going off of your reporting from last week great job but could you imagine just being in that room and you're on a road trip you're you're going up california you're going to alberta and the news cycle is, is just blowing up it's just this team might move your team might move you have no idea what's going on and you're and lawson kraus admitted as much last week when he said that 
they were learning everything just as we were. I, I can't imagine how incensed and emotional these players have been these last few days. I could give as much of an idea, but it, it, it's it's pretty wild to be in their shoes right now. Yeah, and look, a lot of these guys have dealt with the rumors, the innuendo, the speculation for a long time, but it's one thing when it's kind of a rumor that pops up here and there, and then it's another when it's like, this is happening, right? Um, you know, I, I got that sense when I spoke to Vander Kane about the move from Atlanta to, to Winnipeg back in the day. Like, he was saying that the players would hear a little bit, like, they never really believed it was true, or, you know, like, you just... You just don't know what's true, so you, you kind of tune it out, and then all of a sudden he gets a call from Don Waddell, the Thrasher's GM at the time, and says, okay, you're moving to Winnipeg. Um, and, you know, he had, he had a lease. He was a young guy at the time. He said it would be way harder now that he has a family and the like, but, you know, he, he was only 20 years old at that point, but it still was shocking. Like, I think there's, there's no way around that that kind of shock, even even though, you know, in the end, should anyone be that surprised, given how much we've talked about the Coyotes over the last 12, 15 years? <laughs> Um, and some of their struggles and just the fact they haven't been able to, ha to have a clear path to getting a new arena uh, built um, in all that time. You know, I think that that's really my sense is it was about a month ago where Gary Bettman and Bill Daly, you know, sat down with Alex Morello and basically said to him, like, we got to do something here. You know, Morello, from my understanding, wasn't that initially interested in, in parting with his team, just because again, he believes hockey can work in Arizona that, that, you know, he's, he's in this land auction at the end of June, he's got plans and the like, obviously he's been talking to local politicians. Like he's, he's put a lot of work into trying to secure an arena for the team, but ultimately, you know, I think in the process of that conversation, it was basically said, well, this isn't really fair. Like, can you give it definitive timeline? One of your players were members of your staff. Like when will they be in a new arena? And the truth is, is Morello doesn't know that. I mean, no one could possibly know that because, you know, to get an arena built, I mean, he has to get land. He has to develop the land. He has to make sure he gets the right political approval. He obviously just has to construct the building. I mean, sometimes when you're building something, you know, things don't go exactly as planned in terms of the timelines. I mean, it's, it's a complex thing to, to do and it's clearly becoming untenable at Mullet arena. So, you know, I think ultimately that's what pushed this, this to where, okay, in the last 10 days or so, they've really gotten serious about the talks and, and the planning. And, you know, in the meantime, the Coyotes are playing games every night. As you say, they've just had a pretty successful road trip, three and two, uh, you know, had a chance to win in Calgary, you know, blew, blew a lead in that game. But it, they, they nearly won all three games in Western Canada after really the news became public uh, when they were in Vancouver earlier in the week. So, um, you know, maybe as a player, it's it's in the moment you can cart compartmentalize things you get to go play the game you love and in the games i'm guessing it's the time between the games that's that's most difficult right now and and you know fortunately that the end is near in terms of a break coming up for for everyone you know th their day off here monday we'll see if they practice tuesday and then they play wednesday and then it's a long off season and who knows when we see the next game an nhl game in in arizona it might be might be some time I, that, that's the big unknown to me but why does Alex Morello have to be the next Arizona owner if hockey comes back to that state? Why is it him? Why is it not someone else who can deal with this team? This team is in this situation. He's the owner. He has to take responsibility for this. Why does Alex Morello still get that second chance once the dust settles if the NHL wants to come back? You want the truth? Yeah. Yeah. It's because he has all the power at the negotiating table because, you know, the only way the NHL could take a team away from an owner is through something called an involuntary termination. That's a very litigious path to go down. I mean, that, that involves ending up in court. That would be very public. It would be another mark on what is already a franchise. That's got a few dings on it. And, you know, really this is the peaceful, this is the peaceful exit as peaceful as possible. And so what does the NHL have to do here? They're paying him, a lot more money than what he paid initially to get the franchise. And they're giving him this right because he really does believe the team, you know, a team that he's essentially selling for 1 billion right now, it could be worth 2 billion if they have the proper arena. And I'm sure that's, that's along the lines of what he's thinking. And he didn't just have to give back the keys to his team, right? I mean, as much as whatever opinions might be out there as an owner, he owns the team. And he's, you know, he's, he's, as far as I know, been paying the players on time. I mean, those are the sorts of things. If, if you, if an owner stops paying players, those are when the league can step in and take, take control of a franchise. I mean, um, you know, 
it, it this is the path to, to get it done without lawyers, essentially. And of course, there's lots of lawyers involved with completing the sale of NHL teams, but the, the path not to do it in a courtroom potentially. And so he's got that power and he wants to have the team. Now, that's why I think it's not insignificant when I say one of the, the big sticking points that, that I've been told remains is the exact language around that, you know, what he's getting there, because that that is a huge part of this deal. I mean, the, the, the money part is not nothing. Don't get me wrong. But how exactly he can get back and own the team, you know, that, that basically starts a clock for him on, on when he's got to get this done. And, and if we go on past precedent, he's been unable to get an arena, right? That's the only reason we're having this discussion. It's the only reason why I'm sitting in Tempe, Arizona on this Monday morning is because they haven't been able to get an arena. Otherwise this would just be a normal season ending and, you know, there would be not this focus here. So Morello controls the cards in the sense that he didn't want to give up the team. Um, You know, the NHL is incentivized, I would argue to do so for him to do so by putting a billion dollars on the table, by setting a billion dollar expansion fee for him to get the team back. Um, You know, again, all this is pending this deal being done, but I, I think that, exactly how the mechanisms of that deal is. That's what I'm going to be most interested in. When this gets announced officially, I'm going to be most curious about how he can get the team back in Arizona eventually. Um, because, you know, obviously the, it's not an indefinite window and there might be a period there where if, if he doesn't get an arena built, then we're talking about someone else bringing the team back to this market. I, I, I do think, and I've said this so much that anyone, our hundred percenters are like, CJ, we get it. You're beating us over the head with this. But I really want to be clear. I do think that the NHL product will work in Arizona one day. But it's just we could be talking 10 years away. Like, I I don't know when that's going to be because it requires getting the right arena built, having the right ownership situation. And it does appear based on, you know, my reporting here that Morello is going to get the first kick of the can to bring an expansion team back to Arizona should they uh, should should they end up moving to Salt Lake City this offseason. Okay. I guess at this point, the only other thing to really think a lot about in the story is the players and their families and and the staff of that team, too. And I can understand that. I mean, I've been part of it the last few days, just trying to see if we can get some some kind of sense of what they've been feeling. But I could also understand a little bit, too, that the Coyotes have been a little bit restrictive with media access. I'm very curious what's that going to look what that will look like in the coming days while you're in Tempe, because we only really got a few guys after their game yesterday. They had like two days in Calgary and they did not talk. And I don't want people to take this as me complaining. I I, I actually think that considering everything that's going on with this team, I'm just recognizing that this is just the PR staff, just trying to shield everybody from what's going on. We literally had a scrum busted in Calgary yesterday because Andre Turini was asked how he felt the organization was handling everything. And he declined to comment on that like i'm very intrigued at the pr media side of things at how the players are processing everything and how they're being put under the microscope for all of us to to kind of look at yeah i would imagine the pr strategy is something along the lines of the less said publicly the better yes um you know and i can appreciate that because to a degree i mean obviously it's our job i would love to sit down with players and and have a real conversation not about that's just the thing like when they say like, it's not like I would be asking anything like, hey, do you think the team's being relocated? Like, they don't, I understand, they don't know. They're an employee in this case. I mean, they're being kept in the loop to some degree as much as possible by the NHLPA. You know, Bill Armstrong met them on Friday night or afternoon in Edmonton and, and shared what he could share. But even that was not a definitive, like, this is what's happening, at least not my understanding of events. I think it was more along the lines of, yeah, it looks like we're moving. If you move, you're, we're going to give you a chance. Or there will be an opportunity to go to Salt Lake City, see what it's all about you know, get a feel for things before it happens, you know, but, but this isn't done yet. And here we are Monday. It's still not done yet. You know, it it must be a burden. I would think on some of the older players, especially, I mean, if you're a young guy, I mean, maybe there's one exception, Josh Doan, uh, who's playing for his hometown team. The one his father Shane was a legend for. I mean, I can't imagine there's any world where he's happy about the way this is going uh, for obvious reasons. I mean, He's, he's lived his dream even this last couple of weeks. I mean, he's, he gave his fifth goal last night. I mean, what a start to his NHL career. Yeah. And to do it and to do it for his hometown team just before uh, for perhaps it's it's moved to another city. But, I mean, in general, if you're a younger player, I think you're just happy to be in the league to, for, for the most part. But, you know, players with houses, players that have been here a long time, Clayton Keller, Nick Schmaltz, um, you know, Alex Kerfoot signed here as a free agent to last summer, you know, multi-year deal, probably – you know, knowing, I guess, that there's always the possibility of a move, but not necessarily expecting that. You know, 
I would like to hear the the human side from those guys, but the reality is I, I don't know that we're going to get it until some future point, you know, after everything's official, probably after the season's ended. You know, ironically, this trip for me was planned, Julian, um, mm-hmm. with The Athletic prior to all this blowing up. In fact, the, the pitch at that, you know, for the original idea for the trip was to come down here and talk to players just about the weight of this season, like what they've been through. You know, basically all these issues, what it was like playing a second year for those that have been here out of Mullet Arena. You know, what their thoughts are about the, the uncertain future. What's it like to go into a summer not knowing where your team's next game will be played, at least not definitively. Um, all that's gotten kind of blown up in ways that we couldn't have anticipated with with how, you know, I think it's really just a fact. It's only been about the last 10 days, maybe 10, 12 days is my understanding that this, that like the sale process has really gone into overdrive. And then obviously some of that information's or a lot of it's getting out into the public realm. And now it created this circumstances that I, I think are a little uncomfortable, probably for a lot of the players. They're looking for answers too. You know, I can tell you that there has been some communication with the players about what they might get. If there's uh, a move, you know, they're looking at getting sort of a flat expansion fee. Um, obviously your moving expenses would be covered. And then I think that they're, they're going to get, at least it's being discussed, a series of payments that basically help with what's called house transition, because you know, obviously some players are maybe breaking a lease. I don't know exactly how everything works in, in Arizona. I can tell you in Ontario where I live that it's hard to move on a moment's notice. Generally, you're locked into a specific period with your lease. There, there would be costs associated with stepping away from that. And so, you know, while these guys are playing these last few games and not talking to you and I, they are on the phone and they are having these discussions about, you know, what would be owed to them and what this is going to look like. And, you know, in some senses, if this is going to be finished, as everyone's hoping, you know, Ryan Smith and Ashley Smith and in, in Silver Lake, Alex Merrill in Arizona, the NHL brokering the deal. You know, I do hope it can just get finalized sooner rather than later. Cause I, I do think some finality, like rip the band-aid off, um, would be beneficial to all. I mean, it's not great. That's a little consequence, I realize, if you're a Coyotes fan out there listening to this. Um, you know, unfortunately, I think the writing's on the wall for you. And it's not at all your fault. Like that's that's a difficult thing with teams moving, is is this, you know, the Coyotes have actually made money in Mullet Arena more than they made in Glendale, which is like both a good thing because it's a sign, okay, if, if they, you know, have the team playing in an area, as they've always said, that they can generate more revenue. But it's also an indictment on the fact that this team has been here for 28 years and it's in a 4,600 seat college arena where they're actually generating the most revenue they've ever generated by season. Um, you know, it just tells you a lot about how dire, how bad things were when they were playing in Glendale, which is a long way away from where I'm sitting today, uh, even though I'm in Tempe. So, you know, it's 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 this is in some ways, I think, a clean break uh, for for everyone, for the NHL. I mean, this this can't be a deal the league really wants to be stepping in and making. But I think it's the best option and it helps to have an ownership group in Salt Lake that you feel comfortable with. Um, and it, and it does give a chance, I think once and for all, just to say, okay, for the, if you're on the staff or the team of the Coyotes, if you're, you're going to get professional or more professional, um, work conditions, and we're going to take a proper run at getting this done in Arizona and come back in due course. Thinking about Wednesday, that game at Mullet Arena, what do you think the crowd is going to be like? I think it'll be emotional. Honestly, I think it'll be, you know, Sports are irrational, Julian. Like we we've all feel it for our various different teams. You could be watching a soccer game on a Saturday morning or Sunday morning, and it's it's like barely even you've barely even had your first sip of tea yet, and you're already yelling swear words at a TV. Like like don't make a mistake. I mean, people are very invested in the team here. I think that's one thing that it was sort of miscategorized. Um, you know, going back ten or fifteen years, like when the whole Jim Balsilli thing was in the bankruptcy courts, it kind of became an argument like. You know, Jim Balsillie is coming to restore, you know, hockey in Canada. It, ca- it became kind of like a regional debate as much as anything, right, about, you know, people have more interest in this in Canada. I think I think with time looking at it, it's it's more nuanced than that. And, and I have no doubt that there's a huge following for hockey. I mean, look at the number of players coming up to the NHL or prospects now, players playing in the, the national development program with Arizona, you know, you know, birthday birthplaces beside their name. I mean, it's exploded yeah. in, in, in the last number of years. They, they do fill the arena at Mullet arena. Now I know a lot of times it's, it's opposing fans or it's been opposing fans, you know, making a road trip out of it, coming down to maybe hit a game in Arizona, hit a game in Vegas. It's a pretty good way to spend a February road trip. If you're a fan of a team from a, a cooler climate. Um, 
I, but I think it'll be emotional. I think that you'll see a lot of maybe outward emotions, early signs. I think it'll be weird. I've never covered anything like that. Uh, you know, I've done just about once one of everything, if not more, but I've never been there for the final game of a team where it's kind of known that, that it's their final game. You know, I, I do feel bad genuinely for the people that have poured a lot of work into trying to make this work uh, or, or money and time in terms of being a fan and going to games and becoming invested and buying those sick Kachina jerseys. And, you know, like it's, it, you know, I think it'll be very strange. Uh, it's the probably the best way to put it. It's it's going to be weird, and, and strangely enough for me, it's the, my first time at Mullet Arena. I've never actually been to a game there. I covered loads and loads really? of Coyotes games. No, over over the years, I covered lots of games at the formerly named Gila River Arena uh, in the Westgate Complex in Glendale, but I've never been until Wednesday uh, in this city for a game. Please let me know your thoughts on Mullet Arena. I've been, and it's something that. Anyone who covers hockey or anyone who's into hockey should see once, not because it's this grand, amazing arena. You just kind of have to see it to believe it and, and get a real good look at the arena and, and give me your sense of what watching a game from the press area is like. And I mean, if you're going to also, if you're going to hang around the visitor's room, look at how the setup is for that. Like, like yeah, try yeah, to get a real good look. Try to get a real good look at what the setup is like in that arena. I would love to know your thoughts about Mullet. Yeah, I mean, it's it's not an NHL arena, right? It's, it's a college oh, arena. Oh, we know that. And on top of it, the Coyotes are the second tenant, right? Like, it's it's the university team is the primary tenant there. Like, they had to build those annexes, they called them, basically the areas outside the building for the dressing room and staff areas. I mean, look, they, they as actually Kane, Evander Kane said this, like he was saying it once, it's not an easy, but he's like, they did the best with what they have. Like he did acknowledge they made an effort to make it as workable as it could be, but it's, it's not great. Um, and, uh, and look, our next show is Thursday. That's after Wednesday night. I'm sure, you know, as much as we'll be casting our eyes forward to the Stanley Cup playoffs at that point, you know, we're going to be talking about what it was like to be in the building. And I'll give you my impressions of, you know, see if I can compare it to anything, you know, I, this league's played out of some barns, man. Like I, you know, the, the old, old, old uh, arena in Uniondale uh, where the Islanders played, like I, they did actually soup it up a little bit, uh, but Nassau Coliseum, it, it was, it, it was something out of another era. I mean, literally it is from another era, but it was, it was, it was very Spartan. Um, yeah. And we'll see, look at, we should just a quick put a bow on this. The, the yes. Salt Lake end of this is not perfect either. Like they're moving into a 33 year old arena Delta center, assuming this goes through that, you know, is an NBA first facility. Like, I think there's, I've seen it reported. It was 14,000 for hockey. Ian Mendez, who was down there for the athletic and spoke to Ryan Smith said, it's going to be more like 11,000 for the NHL. Yeah. Um, you know, th that building needs a lot of upgrades and improvements, but they're not going to happen overnight. It's not like this summer, it's magically going to be turned into, you know, the mobile arena or one of the new, you know, uh, little Caesars arena in Detroit, like one of the new ones on the, 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 the strip here that are pretty nice. I mean, it's, it's, it's not perfect either. Now I think the, the caveat there though, is there's a real hope and expectation. There's, there's a brand new facility coming with the Olympics uh, bid that Salt Lake's involved with. So, you know, it's, it's still going to be somewhat makeshift, I think is maybe the best way to put it. Um, but, you know, you're getting a different, different ownership group, different energy. You know, we haven't talked much about the Coyotes as a hockey property. If they're no. managed right, I do think that this could be a team. I mean, they're over 70 points this year. Uh, they're, they're obviously operated on a very tight budget. Like if, if Ryan Smith's willing to invest in the roster in terms of spending more than Alex Morello did on players, you know, they have unlimited cap space right now. They have all the draft picks in the world. I mean, I don't even know what the rest of the, the league has to go to the draft. I mean, we might just do it from the Coyotes office or, or the Utah team's front office. Cause they have so many picks. Whoa, to make. whoa, whoa. Don't get too hasty. We're already not happy about the centralization of the draft CJ. Well, I mean, I'm just saying like, like they, they are set up. They have no, what I would call inefficient or bloated contracts on their, on their cap sheet. Now, part of that is they have very few players sign long terms. And the one they do are guys like Clayton Keller, who you're happy to have signed long term. I mean, he's an asset to the organization, a very good player. He's not paid more than his production, those sorts of things. So I think the Coyotes slash Utah team could be pretty competitive if managed the right way here. 
in the short term. Like, I could see them challenging for a playoff spot next year. You have to squint your eyes and imagine it. They have no defensemen signed right now, as far as I know. I know they have some restricted free agents, so it's not as though they're, they're turning over their entire blue line. But, you know, there, there's a lot of unknown boxes when you when, when you call up that cap sheet. But I think they actually do have the makings of a team that could be pretty darn good in, in the near term. But that's going to require the right ownership, the right support, and obviously good decisions by the Hockey Operations Department. Yeah. Uh, we may touch on Utah – by Thursday, depending on how things or if things are announced. Uh, do you know what else we could be likely talking about come Thursday? The possibility of Austin Matthews at 70 goals. We could also be talking about Nikita Kucherov at 100 assists. And wouldn't it be something if Connor McDavid, maybe not tonight against the San Jose Sharks, if he's available to come back, but what if he reaches that 100 assist marker himself against Arizona on Wednesday. There's still a lot to look at in terms of some milestones, and we're looking at three players who will definitely show up on, on NHL MVP ballots this year. Uh, what do you think of those stories? Well, I mean, they're not just milestones. We're talking about milestones that haven't been achieved for 30-plus years. Um, you know, it's been a long time since any player has had 100 assists. There's only three that have ever done it. Pretty wild that you might see two in the same season here. You know, Austin Matthews, we've talked a lot about his goal chase, but 70 goals is, it's not something that most players ever thought would be possible. Uh, I actually have a story that will be coming this week where I talk to some of the best players of the last generation about Matthews, about his chase for 70. And there is an immense amount of like, holy crap, even from guys like Crosby and Ovechkin and Stamkos. Uh, Patrick Kane had a chance to talk to him on the weekend when Detroit was through Toronto, you know, these are these are milestones you almost never thought, even at the start of the year, even with McDavid, right? Who's sort of made the the impossible possible throughout his career. You know, he hit 150 points. That you know, we never saw we actually saw that uh, a couple of years ago. I mean, I think that these are crazy milestones and and they're they're interesting situations. You know, McDavid has missed the last couple of games injured. It's my understanding he's gonna play at least one more of the Oilers' remaining games. They, they still have three left. Um, and so Based on the numbers, I mean, if McDavid plays a game, you got to think he's getting an assist. But yeah. at the end of the day, to get an assist, and, and don't get me wrong, like he's had lots of plays where it's a tap in for his dude. He needs someone else to shoot the puck in the net, right? Like he controls it to the extent that he always controls things offensively. He's making plays that, that give his teammates an opportunity to score. But, you know, he could, he could deliver a puck right to the doorstep and, and a player on his team might hit the post or shoot wide or flub it or, you know, like, like you never know. So, you know, it looked like it was a foregone conclusion to get there. Unfortunately, you know, he suffered an injury a week or so ago or re, you know, re, uh, re injured something. Now, you know, he will play again. I think Kucherov's going to get there. Um, yeah. Because he's, he's healthy enough to play Tampa's remaining games. You know, Matthews, he scored in eight straight games. He's actually matched his career high uh, by scoring his 69th goal of the season on Saturday. Nice. And, you know, <laughs> sorry, I didn't mean to laugh at that. That was so immature of me. Oh, God. I knew well, I was it was immature of me to throw it in there. <laughs> but, you sorry, know, it's Monday. I'm this, tired. Go ahead. This will be fascinating. This guy has played as much as he scored. He's never in his whole career scored nine straight games. Like, that's what it's going to take for him to hit the milestone on Tuesday in Florida. And if he doesn't, at least play Wednesday in Tampa. And I actually think there is a real genuine debate about how to handle that. I found it interesting on Saturday, Sheldon Keefe acknowledged for the first time, really, that, that he's got, he got caught up in it. He played Matthews 24 minutes in that game. You know, partly that was due to the fact that went to overtime. The Leafs were, were you know, pushing to come back in the game at a certain point. They were down pretty big early. Um, they had a late power play. So, you know, he's getting minutes there as they're, as they're trying to, to find a way to get him that last goal. Um, I, don't, I don't know what you do. Like, I guess the real question is, Let's just assume just for this hypothetical, somehow the Panthers don't allow a goal to him. What do you do if you're in the Leafs shoes? I I would be inclined to play him and give him a chance to do it. I just think it's a pretty special number. You, you know, the Leafs are going to open the playoffs next Saturday, but, you know, they're going to more than likely be opening the playoffs in the state of Florida against the Panthers. Um, they're going to be playing that game on a Wednesday in Tampa. It's not a lot of travel. you got th Thursday, Friday, you know, between – getting back. Like I, there's obviously risk of injury, but I mean, there's risk of injury every time a hockey player steps on the ice. I mean, yep. It's just, it's the name of the game. Like when, when should we, 
do we all of a sudden come out and say these guys shouldn't be playing preseason games in September because the odd player gets injured in September, like in a game that literally nobody will ever remember, like even those in attendance forget it ever happened. Whereas I just think the chance to score 70, I know the Leafs have bigger concerns, blah, 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 blah. Come on. The way I expect, you know, I, I think when all of a sudden that, honestly, all three of those players are going to hit the milestones. I just think it matters enough. Their teams know about it. They're going to push for it. and you're talking about history here, man. Like real genuine Dude. history. Dude, I, we've disagreed on things on this show. We've agreed on things on this show. Hmm. I don't think I've ever agreed with you more on this topic. The idea of benching a player just as they're about to make history, just because you want to preserve them for the playoffs. Like I can understand the thinking to a certain extent, but at the end of the day, you got to play the man at the end of the day. This has to happen. This goes for all three of these players when it comes to the milestone. You look, if Connor McDavid needs that time to recuperate, he has the games left to get that mile, get that one hundred that one hundred assist. He's going to get it. He's going to get assist. It. It's going to it's going to happen. Play the dude. It's like, what are we doing here for Austin Matthews? He has two games left. Play him. Let him get the 70th, 70th goal. Let him celebrate something. Seeing him score that sixty ninth goal the other night, like, come on, man! Like he wants this really bad oh, and i don't know you, how that goes come on i don't know how that's gonna go if you just bench him for the rest of the season and you don't let him get to that 70th like I, come on i mean look he's a pro like i'm sure like he he knows the bigger picture too but like this is it's you know it's if nothing else like this season for the leafs this last month it's been kind of like yeah there was maybe a chance they were going to catch the teams above them but it wasn't likely they weren't likely to get caught from behind like this has been something to focus on for them right i, I think similarly William Nylander's got a chance at 100 points for the first time. He's actually been in a slump down the stretch, but I think it's something for the teammates to, to rally around and get excited about. I, to me, you're seeing that with the Leafs. Like they've, they did lose in overtime on the weekend, but they've, they've won a lot of games lately, and it feels like they're kind of galvanized a little bit around these sort of chases. I mean, it's a long season, man. Like at the end of the day, like I, I know that the counter argument is, well, none of this matters, and like it's just a number and blah, 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 blah. But like, it, it clearly does matter to him. I think it's been something that he's he's focused on and they're focused on. And so probably the easiest thing, I'm sure what the Leafs coaching staff is hoping for is they're preparing for Tuesday's game against the Panthers, is he just does it then. It's easy then to sit him out if he wants that game off or just to, to put him in bubble wrap for that game. He's still got the milestone. Like, that's the best of all worlds. But, you know, it doesn't always work out that way. And it's it's hard as, as much as he makes it look easy, it's hard to score in every game. And he's scored in every game, but he's one short right now. And it'd be fascinating if they sat him at Wednesday when he was, if he's still on 69. No, just at that point, that number will not be nice if he doesn't get past 69. I'm sorry. Well, and, I had to say. And I, I would put it this way. He could play both games and still not get it, of course. Right. I mean, true. he has, he's gone multiple times this season where he went two or more games. He didn't score a goal, but at least you gave him a chance then. Like at least there's no, Coulda, woulda, shoulda, yeah, but I mean, um, you know what I'm saying? Like, like you, you just do it. So, who knows? I mean, yeah. he's pretty automatic right now. <laughs> I, I, I just feel like he's going to find a way, but you never know. I mean, the, the other team's trying to. If Sergei Bobrovsky's playing in that, he's going to be doing all he can to not. He doesn't want that on him. He doesn't want that highlight, right? Yeah. Here's the question: If he does it, do you empty the bench? Um, no, because it's not it's a, like the most goals ever scored in a season. Okay. I still, I, I have no, this is not an insider thing. I have no knowledge, but I think, I think you see them do it. They did it when John Tavares got his thousandth point. That's um, okay. Well, that, that's true. They did do that. So, you know what? I could see them doing it. Yeah. That's I get, I got no insight. I just like, I've, I, you know, that's I think actually a good question. Cut, Everyone's in, like kind of wondering what the moment will be like. I think because Austin is a very cool guy in the sense like he doesn't he doesn't get too emotional in his interviews, right? Like he doesn't he doesn't reveal that side of himself. I think it's probably what makes him great is I think he is a pretty steady person. But you're seeing it in his goal celebrations. Like if you go back from 60 onwards, other than I think there might have been one empty net goal in there where obviously he's not celebrating, but like it it looks like he's a man on a mission to to get this done. I honestly never thought I'd see 70. Straight up. Like I've never seen se I've never seen seventy. Right, 
but Patrick Kane said, like I asked him about, it. he's like, 60 used to be the number. He's like, when when Stamkos and Ovechkin got there, that felt like huge. He's like, no one even thought about 70. Like this is like the, the cool part about this is like I think about kids, right? I mean, what are we doing ultimately in sports, right? Like we we know it's kind of meaningless on some level, yeah. but like you're you're but Matthews is kind of like setting a bar for the next generation. And, and whether that's I don't know if it's like someone like Connor Bedard who's in the early stage of his career, or maybe a kid watching us at home, but I guarantee you kids are excited about it. I mean, Sheldon Keefe said he was at a minor hockey rink this week and he had like 12, 10 year olds run up to him. They wanted to know like when they, like how many thought Austin was going to get. And like, they're all excited by it. I mean, this is the sort of stuff that sparks a, a like different level of interest in the league. I, I remember as a kid, Julian, one of the first, I think it was the first NHL game I went to, Mario Lemieux was in the midst of his crazy long scoring streak. I think he got to about 46 games, give or take. Apologies if I'm a little off on that. But he played a game in Toronto. It was the first game my dad ever got tickets to. And I went a, as a kid. And, like, you know, first of all, like, seeing Mario Lemieux at that time, like, it, you know, highlights and stuff weren't what they were. I wasn't walking around with a cell phone or tablet able to watch everything. So, like, even just seeing him, it felt like crazy. And the Leafs almost held him off the scoreboard that night. Like, he got to the third period before he got a point. But I just remember, like, things like streaks or milestones or these things, like, I think they're part of what creates excitement in in kids. And, and so, you know, Matthews grew up watching Patrick Kane and Ovechkin and Crosby and Stamkos. And he's doing something they've never, they would never manage to accomplish. And what, that, those four guys are going to the Hall of Fame. If they don't play another game, they're going. And and he's sort of past them. And like I just I like the idea that if he gets this, a I think it'll be a cool moment. But b I do think it now sets a new target for the next generation. And if we've learned one thing about sports, there's always a next one coming along, and somebody's going to come along and score seventy five or something again. Like I just I, it's anyway. Okay, it's just a little bit of more there's a little bit of magic in there is what I'm saying. Like there's like a little bit of like. There's, there's a je ne sais quoi to this, like that I think is more than just a round number and more than just a milestone and a good story for you and I. Like I think that there's, I think that the streaks like this kind of like sparked it a little more interest in the sport. I have one more question before we get to the next topic and then ask CJ. Last one. one Actually, did you see Corey Connors what? at the Masters was asked about it? Oh, really? I didn't know that. Yeah, Corey Connors weighed in from the <laughs> Masters on this. So like, there's an example. Like what? Why else would a professional golfer, when else would a professional golfer during the biggest tournament of the year be getting asked about a hockey player and actually commenting? It was in like the official master's transcript. Wow, so. I see it. So he got asked straight up, do you think Matthews can get to 70 goals? And he says, I hope so. The fellows are going to be feeding him. That would be pretty sweet. This is the question I want to ask you. What's the biggest milestone you've ever been in the building for? Is it that Mario thing? Is it something else? Wouldn't be the Mario thing because like that was that was a game on the way to his streak. Like I don't know what game number that would be. I could I could really scour Hockey Reference and get you an answer, but it, you know he kept he kept it going. Honestly, the biggest individual thing. I mean, the Crosby Golden Goal has got to be it. I, I was there in Ottawa the night Matthew scored four in his NHL debut. Um, so that, I mean, in terms of just like that, that might honestly the Matthews four goal debut might. Yet. I mean, the gold medal game was going to be a crazy, like, once in a lifetime thing. Anyway. That's like an iconic moment for sure. But, yeah. like, I'm thinking more like the number. Like, you, like, a, like, you're, you're in the building for somebody getting, like, a milestone win or a milestone goal, like, four goals in a game. Like, that doesn't happen all the time. But, like, like, what I yeah, think of four this, goals in your it, NHL debut, it never happened and it has in the history of the entire that NHL. Works. That works. That works perfectly. And he, then. And people might forget he had the fourth goal just before the second intermission. He actually had a chance to add to that, and he had a chance to score a fifth in the third period. Um, it just was a weird night. It was like a night where I remember it felt like lightning kind of struck or something. Like you just knew you were watching something you probably wouldn't see again, and in fact, no one had ever seen before that day. Um, I mean, I've only been in the building a handful of times when any player has scored four goals. So, like again, to, I, that's probably got to be it. Like. Maybe some of our Edmonton colleagues were there. Sam Sam Gagne had an eight point game. Obviously, mm -hmm. some of the, our older colleagues were around for Gretzky's big nights. Uh, I don't think anyone would be left in the media core that covered Daryl Sittler's ten point game, but like something like that. Like those are sort of the ones. It's got to be Matthews's four goal debut is where I'm going to settle. Actually, now that I talked okay. this through, I'm thinking about it now, and it might be uh, when I was around for. Marc-Andre Fleury's 500th win, and he did it in Montreal, and all of the cool. fans 
were just losing their minds. And even like Canadians players stayed on the ice to give him stick taps. Like that was, that was one of the most insane crowd experiences I've ever seen. And this is for a guy who just didn't has, has not to this point played for the Montreal Canadians. But of course, as a, or good to she knew, as they would say, they was given that ultimate respect after reaching an incredible milestone in his career. I think right. that's my answer. Yeah. Well, now, so now Matthews is on the road. I don't, I don't know what the crowd will be like. I mean, Leafs fans travel pretty well, but it, it won't be the same. Had he done it at home on Saturday, that was that was probably the storybook moment, especially Patrick Kane on, on the other side for the Red Wings was his, yeah. really his, his main childhood idol. Uh, I know there's immense respect between those two guys. I mean, if you're writing a clean story, and I actually did write a story that would have went up that night, uh, that, that would have been the most storybook. But, I mean, look, at if he gets there, even if he doesn't get there, it was, it was, it was a good chase. Yeah, I, I was looking forward to it. I was I was out with some buddies chowing down on brisket. I was I was literally sitting back, like hoping he would score this goal. Uh, but uh, nah, not to be. But but it'll happen this week. Um, this next topic, I, I gotta admit, a bit of a tough tr- tougher transition. We don't have to spend too long on it before we get to ask CJ. But uh, Joe Quenville, uh, the former Chicago coach, uh, also was in Florida before he was let go because of uh, his involvement in the Kyle Beach scandal, uh, spoke on the Cam and Strick podcast last week. I have some thoughts on the podcast. I think I'll reserve it for now, but he did try to take as much responsibility as he could for the situation. And of course, anytime anyone from that, from that story speaks publicly, the next question is how soon until we see them back into the NHL? Do you know if anything is afoot when it comes to Joel Quenville and his situation. As far as I know, his status, the status of Stan Bowman remains unchanged, um, which is that they, they can't work in the league. And, you know, I think where we'll be trying to zone in on this a little bit more is as we move to the off season and, you know, perhaps that, that could be looked at by the league's leadership. But I, you know, I don't have a sense that it's, it's imminent or that anything's necessarily afoot. I mean, it's pretty clear I think from both of those individuals, remember they were at the NHL GMs and coaches meeting back in September in Chicago, where they discussed their experiences. I mean, it's clear both men want to work in the league again, but they don't currently have that right. And, you know, let's face it, that front office and coach hirings really only tend to happen basically between the period we're entering right now, mid April, call it, and the start of July, generally speaking, like this is when personnel decisions for the most part are made in, in the NHL. And so, it is, if it's going to be for next season, it's probably got to come soon. And and the best I can tell you is I just don't have any reason to believe that that's going to be the case. Now, of course, it could change, but um, you know, this is uh, it's 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 a tough one for the league. I think you know it, you're balancing what's appropriate punishment. You know, in, in you know in Joel Quenville's case too, he's just he's getting to an age where he doesn't have you know infinite number of years where he could return. Like if the league says it's, you know, one more season, but then you're fine. I mean, you're just getting to a stage where maybe he gets aged out of the kind of jobs that he would like to have. And, you know, Stan Bowman's much younger. And so I think I do believe there'll be a day that both of these guys will be allowed to work in a league again. Like, I don't think this is a lifetime punishment, but it still feels like one where the league wants to be very careful with it. You know, obviously they don't like these, the, the sort of story hanging over anything. So you know, let's let's kind of see where we're at. You know, maybe come the Cup final. You know, Gary Bettman speaks traditionally on the first day of the Stanley Cup final. I mean, I, I think that that's a time when we maybe will get some clarity one way or the other. If if that, I don't know if you call it a ban or whatever suspension, I don't, whatever it is, is going to be lifted. But as of this moment, um, it hasn't been. Mm-hmm. Okay, we can circle back on this. And with that, it's time for us to get to ask CJ. We'll be taking questions off of Discord and Twitter. Sorry. X. I keep calling it Twitter. I'm not probably never going to change my mind. I'm never going to change my mind. It's Twitter. Uh, We'll take in your questions. We'll answer as many as we can get to. Let's start with Cam Jenkins. People still call it the Sky Dome. The Sky Dome is a superior name to Rogers Center. Sorry, not sorry. Right, Right, but I mean, Uh, yeah. I just call call, call call whatever is your heart tells you to call it, buddy. You just get me, dude. Anyway, Cam Jenkins, is Matt Murray going to rise from the dead like The Undertaker and play a game in the Stanley Cup playoffs? 
if he plays a game in the Stanley Cup playoffs, something has gone wrong, uh, horribly wrong. Because, you know, obviously a season for any team in the playoffs can end quickly. I mean, you only you only need to lose four games, which, you know, could be played in the span of a week. And so the, for him to play, the Leafs are both probably going to have to play deeper into the spring because he's only made one American Hockey League conditioning start. And I think it's fair to assume or to surmise that the Leafs would want him to get more action before ever thrusting him into that position. So the Leafs are going to have to win – but also be winning while losing other goaltenders because they obviously have Ilya Samsonov, um, Joseph Wall, and and Martin Jones would be ahead of Matt Murray on the on the the, the chart. So, you know, there is a set of circumstances. We'll call it. We'll, we'll like we'll like open it. It's like the chaos box. There is some kind of chaos box where it could happen, but it's still extremely unlikely. That being said, I don't want to take away from the work Matt Murray's put in after having, you know, serious hip procedure done in October to get himself back in position. A lot of that work was, you know, boring rehab by himself, not with the team that where he's now, you know, playing pro hockey games, you know, working his way back to playing in the NHL. I think, you know, if the question is, is he going to play in the NHL next season? I think that's likely. I think someone will give him a chance. It might be in Toronto, maybe it's somewhere else, but you know, clearly he wants to resume his career as an NHL goaltender. And I think he'll get the chance to do so. Just, just feels like, Something weird's got to go on. Put it that way. Like that's that's the true story. Is is the the Leafs would start Samsonov, Wall, and I believe Martin Jones likely before Matt Murray at this point in time in a must win game or in a big game in the playoffs. And so I don't know how he's going to get himself in playing shape, get the team comfortable with him, and pass three guys on the depth chart um, before the end of the playoffs. But stay tuned. That's why they play the games. I didn't expect to see a, a Zamboni driver in an NHL game, and that happened once too. I don't know if we want to rehash that for some of our listeners. But from Pokalem, what is each of your opinions on people wearing signed jerseys and hats as if it was a regular jersey hat? For example, wearing it while grocery shopping. I've got no negative opinion on that. I mean, I really almost have no opinion. But I'm like, wear your jersey if you want to wear your jersey. But like I, I think it's not just the fact that it's wearing a jersey, it's the fact that it's signed. That's how that's what I'm focusing on. Like I have no problem wearing jerseys. My apprehension is depending, especially depending on who the signature is, like if you're wearing a signed jersey out there, like do you really wanna sully that? Like just keep it in your house. Frame I guess the question like, is why, why did you out? get why did you get it signed if you wanted to wear it? Like I think of a signed jersey you would usually get I mean, maybe a kid, see, this is the thing. Kids don't, aren't thinking this way. And maybe a kid's wearing his or her jersey and they see the player and they get it signed. Like, and, and they're not thinking, I'll never wear my jersey. But generally speaking, if you're getting a signed jersey, you're going to frame it and put it up on your wall. or Like, usually you're getting it signed for as a keepsake. Um, but I wouldn't be like, if I saw a man wearing like a signed, I don't know, Rasmus Anderson jersey at the grocery store. Like, I don't think I would, I wouldn't be like, how, how dare he? I'd I'd be I good for him, but I would I would think that for the life of that jersey, it would be best served preserved somewhere else, and not you at Safeway trying to buy cereal or something. I don't know what if I don't know what I don't know what other hazards could come up from 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 wearing such a thing. But I'd rather not wear a signed jersey in public. I don't have a problem wearing jerseys in public. I would rather not wear a signed any type of memorabilia in public. I don't even have a signed jersey, so it's not a problem for me. Plus, I don't wear jerseys, so. Yeah, well, we, we differ on that. It's just, I mean, I still, I still think it's a cool style thing. I, feel, I still yeah, think yeah. it's cool, but we have different, we have different style approaches. I think we sure. do. And I'm not out there saying you or other people should or shouldn't wear a jersey, like in general. I just, I feel like for me, like covering sports as long as I have, it just feels like it'd be kind of weird. Like even it. Like I, the furthest I'll go is I'll wear like a Blue Jays hat to a Jays game, but like yeah. Or I guess if I had a t- I don't have a t shirt, but I, if I had like a t shirt or something that is that that has like the team logo on it, I'd wear that. But you know what I'm saying? Like I, it's just it's a me thing. It's not a it's this isn't about what other people should do. Next one from Dallas Stars fan. How about Wrexham getting another promotion to League One? Back to back promotions for uh, Wrexham. Never in doubt, brother. Actually, Never. it wasn't doubt. They, they they did lose some games, kind of in the the, the three quarter mark on of the season that it got pretty tight. Uh, but it's that's cool. And and 
it just makes me excited, honestly, for the next season of Welcome to Wrexham. Um, it was pretty cool watching what they did with season two when they went up a league. I mean, now it's getting real. Now they're like getting within breathing distance of some of the the truly bigger clubs. Like this isn't just like a cute story anymore. And, you know, there'll be new challenges with that, right? Like obviously Ryan Reynolds and, you know, they've, they've got a lot more money than you and I, but like they're, 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 comp- they're going to be competing at a different uh, tax bracket than what they're accustomed to, to, to keep doing that. And so, you know, it's awesome to see them up another league, but uh, you know, I just think of like it, like it's so cool they're going to document this whole thing i mean yeah. who's to say they can't reach the premiership at some point i mean i don't expect it to happen in two more years or anything but like i i could see you know it could happen in the next 10 years shout out to you uh saying premiership i i i love the name premiership i know it's premier league but i love the name premiership same meaning anyway katie linton asks ultimate chocolate covered snack almonds and raisins are my top two Oh, I love a chocolate covered almond. Those are bomb. I I yeah. could I could eat a whole I could eat a whole bag of them things. Oh my god, I want one now. I had over the weekend actually. There's like this this I think it's kind of a famous Toronto thing, but I didn't know about it called Craig's Cookies. Have you heard of it? Never heard of it. But the store basically like bakes like chocolate bars into cookies. Oh. But I had a cookie that was like mini eggs and it was so good. It was like, it's hard to explain, but it was like a cookie made with mini eggs. And it was like, like I'm, I'm actually upset that I now know it exists because I might be tempted to try to get another one because it was like so decadent, so good, but I really should not be eating that. Um, anyway, chocolate covered almond for the win, but also the mini egg cookie was just my goodness. Is is Craig's Cookies like the Toronto equivalent of what we have in Montreal, Felix and Norton? Apparently, people in Montreal love that brand. Maybe it's not the same thing. It it could be honestly. I don't know. Like I was at someone's house and they had them and they offered me one and it was really good. So, yeah. but like I don't, I didn't, I don't like I've heard people talk about them, but I don't know a whole lot about the company. Um, okay. But I'll I'll tell you, they're one for one in making an amazing cookie that I've eaten in my lifetime. Uh, from Bailey Michaud, and I know I'm going to ask this question knowing that, uh, you might not even have an answer for this, but what the hell? Uh, Kendrick, Jake Cole, or Drake? Drake. Oh, you're picking Drizzy, huh? Are you, are you aware of the beef surrounding all three of those men right now? No, I've seen headlines, but I've never clicked the story. So I literally have no, I know I'm aware that there's beef. I don't know what the beef is about. I'm just back in the Toronto guy. Ooh. Hey, look, Drizzy came out with a pretty good disc record the, this weekend, man. It, it could it could be riling up. It could be riling up. I, I like the answer. I you know what? I I just want to see chaos. I'm I'm a, I I do like Kendrick. I do like great. I do like Drake. J Cole kind of put himself out. I just want to see chaos. Uh, we I didn't really ask you any real hockey questions in the ask. CJ. Thank you for that. I hope that's okay. Thank you. Thank you for that. <laughs> that's fine. Uh, we can leave it there then. And uh, yeah, good uh, good work with uh, your report in the last few days on Arizona and everything else going on. And uh, we'll be on top of that for the next episode on Thursday. Uh, we'll be back for that. Subscribe to our podcast, however or whenever, or however you listen to our show. We appreciate it all the same. And we'll have stick taps on Thursday. Did you want to add anything else before we wrap this up? No, man. Good show. Have a great week, brother. This is uh, this is it. It's getting real, man. You're going to cover your last Flames game of the season. Locker cleanouts coming, and then the real thing gets going on Saturday night. Yeah, and you get to cover the Stanley Cup playoffs uh, with the Leafs and so many other teams. And best believe here at the CJ Show, we'll be on top of that too. For CJ, I'm Julian. So long. Have a good week. The Chris Johnston Show. Inside the game, twice a week. Follow Chris on Twitter at ReporterChris. And follow Julian McKenzie at JK McKenzie.